Hello friends and welcome back to another virtual story time with Miss Liz. It is getting cold outside in Philadelphia so you see I have my hat on and I have my long sleeves to keep me warm as it's getting cooler outside. Now to round out our week of stories I chose a book about a person that many of us have heard of before. Someone who did so much to advance civil rights and equal treatment for everyone. This story will give a bit of background about this person and the things that they did to bring justice to the United States. Today's book is Martin's Dream Day. It was written by Kitty Kelly and the photographs are by Stanley Tredick. This is about Martin Luther King Jr. Let's see what's gonna happen. Martin's Dream Day by Kitty Kelly, photographs by Stanley Tredick, and published by Simon and Schuster. Martin Luther King Jr. was nervous. He had been up all night writing what would become the most famous speech of his life. Now, Standing at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, he was about to address 250,000 people. That is a lot of people. I would be nervous too. He had never seen that many people gathered in one place before. This is at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC. Do you see all the people? This is a real photo that was taken that day. Men, women, and children were standing row upon row for blocks all around him. And for one full minute, he could not say a word because their applause filled the sky. They were cheering the messenger of their most cherished dreams. Martin Luther King Jr. believed in equality for everyone not just a few. He wanted all people to have the full rights of citizenship. That meant the right to vote, to go to school, and to get a job. In the 1960s, African Americans, that is black people, did not have these basic rights. They could not eat in certain restaurants, go to certain schools, stay in certain hotels, or shop in certain stores. That was called segregation, and it kept people apart based on their race or the color of their skin. That doesn't seem very fair, does it? Martin wanted to change all that, and he dedicated his life to making that change happen. As a minister, he preached that equality was a God-given right, that everyone, blacks and whites, deserved to be treated with the same dignity and respect. That makes sense, it's so simple. He also believed in nonviolence, so he made his demands for equality in a peaceful way. He tried to bring attention to the plight of African-American people by leading marches, sit-ins, and boycotts across the South of the United States. Here are pictures of protests and other actions. This sign says, equal rights now, we demand. But his efforts for change were not enough. He knew he needed something more to make his dream come true. He decided to go to Washington, D.C. to talk to the President of the United States. At that time, it was John F. Kennedy. The time has come, Mr. President, Martin wrote to John F. Kennedy, to let those dawn-like rays of freedom fill the heavens with the noonday sunlight of complete human dignity. Martin made many trips to the White House with other civil rights leaders. They tried to persuade the president to propose a law that would give black people the same rights as white people. After months of meetings and many weeks of telephone calls and telegrams, President Kennedy finally agreed. He too believed in Martin's dream. President Kennedy addressed the nation on television the night before he sent his civil rights bill to Congress. 
We are confronted primarily with a moral issue, he said. It is as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who will represent him, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? It makes sense to me, right? That everybody should be treated equally. But sadly, not everyone believed in civil rights. The president's words angered those who did not want equality. Racists reacted with ugly violence. They beat up civil rights workers. They torched churches and bombed schools. They even killed a follower of Martin Luther King Jr. And yet Congress did nothing. But Martin did not give up. He blew the trumpet of hope. With stirring speeches, he pumped courage into those who were afraid. He proclaimed his belief in the goodwill of America. He insisted that what he called the bank of justice was not bankrupt, that it was full enough to give everyone a golden opportunity. How could Martin show the lawmakers in Congress just how many people in America shared his hope for a better life? He decided that a mass protest march on Washington, D.C. was the best way to make senators and representatives pay attention. Like a general, Martin summoned the troops. First, he called upon the major groups who had been fighting long and hard for civil rights. Groups like Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Then he reached out to churches and synagogues and mosques because he wanted all religions to be represented. He called upon Catholics and Jews, Protestants and Muslims to gather at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963. That is over 50 years ago. But, you know, 50 years ago is not a very long time at all, if you think about it. Martin chose the Washington Mall's magnificent white marble statue of Abraham Lincoln as their meeting place because Lincoln was known as the Great Emancipator. He had abolished slavery. His Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, that was 100 years earlier from the March on Washington had declared freedom for 3.1 million slaves. 100 years later, Martin yearned to free the 19 million descendants of those slaves. People all across the country responded to his call. They made plans to come to Washington on planes, trains, trucks, trailers, buses, and bicycles. One man even roller skated from Chicago. Movie stars and musicians from Hollywood joined writers and poets and artists. Parents brought children, teachers brought students, farmers and firemen, policemen, secretaries, doctors, lawyers, plumbers, all came to Washington to tell Congress to pass the law that would give everyone the same rights. And look at all the people who showed up, people of all backgrounds and colors and beliefs. They shared one common belief, the belief that all people should be treated equally. In solidarity, people in other countries around the world declared their intention to march on August 28th in places like Berlin and Munich and Amsterdam, London, Oslo, Madrid, The Hague, Tel Aviv, Cairo, Toronto, and Kingston, Jamaica. The march took place on a Wednesday, but people dressed as if for Sunday church. Their purpose was serious, so their clothes were proper. Women wore hats and high heels. Men wore white shirts and ties and fanned themselves with straw snap brims. People did dress differently back in those times, 50 years ago. The month of August steams with humidity in Washington, D.C., but the heat did not stop hundreds of thousands of people from coming to the march. It was the largest assembly ever, ever gathered at the feet of Lincoln, and the gathering was joyful. People sat 20 deep around the reflecting pool where they dangled their feet in the water. 
must have felt nice on a hot day. The famous singer, Marian Anderson, who was from Philadelphia, was supposed to open the program with the Star Spangled Banner, but she could not make her way through the crush of people. So Camilla Williams, the first black woman to have a role with the New York City Opera, sang it instead. Soon, soaring music turned the mall into an open air cathedral and filled the skies with song. All of these people and more were enjoying it. After an afternoon of powerful speeches and solemn singing, the most magnificent moment of the day came at the end of the program when Martin Luther King Jr. appeared on stage. Applause rolled across the mall like claps of thunder as the 34-year-old preacher walked to the microphone. Women waved lace handkerchiefs and men stomped and cheered. Everyone expected something spectacular from this man, the most exciting speaker of his time. He had traveled 275 thousand miles that year and given 350 speeches trying to make America understand the desperation of its black citizens. But this audience was his biggest ever and his message would resound for years to come. Martin began by addressing the long struggle, the terrible nights of jail and injustice. He talked about the trials and tragedies African Americans had endured, but he did not dwell on those wrongs. Instead, he urged his people not to be bitter, not to hate, not to seek revenge. Inspired by his words, the crowd roared its admiration. They fell quiet only when he paused for a moment. And in that moment, Mahalia Jackson, a famous gospel singer shouted, tell them about the dream, Martin, the dream. That is when Martin Luther King Jr. put aside his prepared speech. Like a bird bursting from his cage, he took flight. I have a dream, he said, that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Those are real words that Martin spoke and here he is here. For the next 15 minutes, Martin dazzled the crowd with his dream of brotherhood and equality. He encouraged everyone to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Hope pushed Martin forward, the hope for a better life. He shared his vision for a nation that would no longer be divided, but would embrace all its citizens without regard for the color of their skin. The crowd was spellbound as Martin's voice rose to the sky full of that hope. He told America that if it was to become a great nation, it must make the dream of freedom come true for every single person in it. He ended with the words of the old spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. The next year, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A year later, he signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and these laws ensured further equality for Black Americans and all people. Finally, Martin's dream had begun to come true. And that, my friends, is the end. But it is not the end in the struggle for equality. Even today, over 50 years after Martin Luther King gave the speech at Washington Monument, and over 50 years after the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act were passed, we still see that some people in our country are not treated the same, mostly because of the way that they look. And this, my friends, is not right. I hope that all of you will do your very best to be kind and gracious and to treat everyone that you meet with the same respect, no matter what they look like or where they come from or what language they speak or what they believe. That is the right thing to do. And that is what I try to do every day. 
I hope that I will see you all next week as we read more great books. Thanks for watching.